uh, connection. We already have them online. The moderator of this uh, panel will be uh, Mark Millington Buck, who is uh, promoting uh, Moscow Exchange's business in London. And we have Jeremy also online. Mark, Jeremy, can you hear me? Hello. Hope you can hear us. We can hear you, yes. Okay, great, great guys. So I made a short introduction, and now, uh, Mark, please, it's your turn. Uh, Jeremy, thank you again for joining us this year. It's a pleasure to see you on the screen and uh, listen, you know, to your ideas. Mark, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, just want to to start and say that I am. Uh, doing this from a remote location. Uh, my holiday plans all changed very much last minute, very inconvenient for, for this uh, fantastic event, but uh, I promise to do it and I'm glad to be able to, to be the uh, moderator and, and have a fireside chat with Jeremy. Um, so Jeremy, you know, here I am sitting on an island and I'm wondering why there aren't more FX algo trading uh, participants and guys out here with me. Um, I would have thought, uh, as, you, as, as we were told, you know, you're leading the Euromoney charts. Surely it's getting easier and easier every year to stay at the top. You turn on your algo, you add a layer of AI and uh, a bit of machine learning, and you go away for the rest of the year and, and to your own remote island and, and work from there. But it's not as easy as that. Perhaps you could uh, explain that and, and also at the same time give us a little bit of insight. What are the developments going on in the, the global markets right now? And, and how are they evolving, which is why it's not so easy to just disappear to the beach yourself. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And uh, can I just say it's a great shame to not be there in person in, uh, in, in Moscow, that is not on a Greek island somewhere with you, Mark. Um, it definitely uh, doesn't get easier year by year. The competition at the top of the market is extremely fierce. Um, and that comes from both banks and non-banks, particularly in the in, you know in the FX space, which is relatively unique, really, between as as a as a market which is uh, has both banks and non-banks at the sort of at the head of the market. Um, but in particular, there are good reasons why it's more challenging to uh, maintain market position at the at the top of the market than than ever before. And in particular, some of these things relate to, for example, complexity of the market. So the complexity of the market structure is changing all the time and is increasing in nature. So, for example, we see continued fragmentation of liquidity within the FX market, not just in terms of uh, by venue, which is the traditional way that people tend to consider fragmentation, but actually by sort of protocol and by trading protocol. So we see that liquidity is distributed into sort of more and more separate pools of liquidity. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. For example, if you look at, say, uh, ECNs, then on many of the ECNs, for example, they now have uh, a skew safe pool of liquidity, uh, a dark pool of liquidity, private rooms which have um, you know only single participants on them uh, we see uh, you know curated algorithmic uh, execution pools of liquidity etc and so liquidity is becoming more and more fragmented not just by venue but also by type by protocol and we see that really across the whole market um, and there's no real pressure actually within the market for uh, you know significant consolidation within those within those venues. And in particular, we still see uh, you know exchanges etc. buying a lot of uh, you know ECNs uh, on the market. So it doesn't look likely that there's going to be um, a lot of consolidation within that space anytime soon. It doesn't, doesn't, um, isn't it? Isn't it? Wouldn't you say though that? the banks are trying to consolidate the platforms they're going to allow their clients they provide credit to uh, they're, they're going to consolidate that down to a core set of platforms, a core set of STP. And also with the exchanges buying these platforms, again, that should provide some sort of consolidation. But you're saying that actually, despite all that, there's still more fragmentation going on. Despite all that, there's more fragmentation. I mean, we still see new ECNs coming into the market. And in particular, we also sort of, as I mentioned, we see this, this fragmentation by protocol as well. So even if the number of venues remained constant, actually the liquidity on each of those venues is becoming further fragmented by protocol and into separate pools. So that yeah. fragmentation really continues. 
Um, and that's also helping to drive one other major factor within our market, which is the growth of market data, the inexorable growth of market data and the speed of market data. Um, and, you know, that makes it far more challenging for people to enter the market who want to be market makers because it's starting to increase barriers to entry quite significantly into the market. The technology cost uh, uh, and spend required to bring capital to the market as a risk taker um, is ever increasing. And that's happening against the backdrop of markets where spreads are very, very tight. So even though uh, spreads are a little bit wider than pre-pandemic, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a second, but although spreads are a little bit wider than pre-pandemic, what we still see is that spreads are incredibly tight. And so the relative return um, on investment for becoming a market maker is small. Um, and therefore, uh, that is a significant barrier to entry for the market. Um, and in particular, what that leads to is, um, you know, a squeezing out, if you like, of smaller market makers and smaller right. players within the market. And that leads to a situation where less and less market makers are responsible for price formation and price discovery within the market. And that can be quite unhealthy for markets generally. Um, you know, in the situation where, for example, within the primary market, you often see that really two or three uh, market makers are responsible for price formation and price discovery. And I include within that markets as liquid as euro dollar and dollar yen. Okay. And, and the automation and, you know, you hear banks talking about, yeah, we've got machine learning. So they're learning that doesn't really apply just yet. It, 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 the skills and the necessary work to do this, it's still really, really in its infancy. So that's not there, is it? Well, it's in its infancy. It, it does apply and it is relevant, absolutely. And when you look at, uh, you know, this market data issue, what you, one of the things you do have is a big data problem. So given that you have a big data problem, obviously machine learning has a huge, uh, hugely yeah. important role to play in the future. Um, but I wouldn't say it's pervasive within the market and it's certainly not pervasive within the bank technology that I've, that I've seen or, or, or know about. Um, so moving on, to Russia, um, what are the what are the challenges when you take Russia as a region inside the emerging market space for for, for a global liquidity provider, and, and you're wanting to be committed to that sort of region? Yeah, and we are fully committed to the region, so you know that's an important point to sort of make first up. I mean, the, one of the, the 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 major challenges that we see is so. The the, the first thing is probably worth to note actually is that um, when I look at liquidity post-pandemic, if you like. I know we're not actually post the pandemic. I mean, we, people keep talking about us being post-pandemic, but actually we're still right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, you know, indeed, we're in the middle of the second wave across large swathes of Europe, right? Um, but yeah. I think when people, what people really mean is before the sort of market crisis at the beginning of the pandemic, at the beginning of the global pandemic in sort of March and April, and in particular in the middle of March when there was an enormous scramble for US dollars. So I think that therein sort of, uh, you know, lies one of the challenges, which is that liquidity is significantly poorer and remains significantly poorer right. several months after the major point of stress within the market. Um, and we see this uh, across not only emerging markets, but also G10 markets. But it's undoubtedly the case that EM liquidity has not recovered in the same way that G10 and in particular G3 liquidity has. Um, and every um, every every um, calculation that we do of, the, of our own proprietary liquidity conditions index tells us that pretty much all currencies are trading below an index level, which you could set pre-pandemic. So most currencies are significantly weaker in terms of liquidity. And in particular, ruble um, is running sort of at the sort of lower end of the EM currency list. So if I look at the, the, the sort of list of EM currencies, ruble is trading probably somewhere between 25 and 50% of pre-pandemic liquidity levels, depending on you know, the, 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 the particular month that you pick post-pandemic. But liquidity is even worsened really within the last two to three weeks. Um, so that's obviously a major challenge, and it's a major challenge whenever you are looking to be a market maker where liquidity is, is, is significantly challenged and the number of market participants involved in setting the price is relatively limited, as I mentioned. And how, how does it help when the, the exchange, for example, this summer said, look, we want to relaunch or, or reinvigorate our OTC clearing, not just, you know, therefore providing um, credit switching or risk compression and settlement compression on its own marketplace across instruments, but to the OTC marketplace in Russia and maybe internationally as well, 
I think that's an important development for the Russian marketplace. How do you see that working? You know, not just NT Pro, which Moscow Exchange has taken their acquisition in. You talked about exchanges buying uh, liquidity platforms. You know, Moscow Exchange is doing the same. But really opening up the Russian market so that it gets liquidity back, I think it's important that as a clearinghouse, we offer OTC clearing. And does that really, will that really help in the long term um, to, to get this liquidity back into, into Russia? So I think OTC clearing, I mean, first up, Mark, I'll sort of split my answer into two parts, right? The first okay. is that I think OTC clearing is something I'd like to see globally, right, across all foreign exchange markets. I mean, I listened to David Mercer's uh, session earlier, and he talked about, for example, uh, you know, real-time settlement across the blockchain and trading, you know, digital fiat currency, et cetera, et cetera. And I fully concur with his view on that. Um, I'm obviously sort of uncertain of what the timeline on that looks like and minded to think that it takes quite a lot longer for those changes to happen than perhaps we might like. Um, bilateral credit remains a massive friction through the entire global market, not just in Russia. Russia in Russia, for sure, it's, it's, it's exacerbated and exaggerated. But OTC clearing is something that would uh, help with liquidity enormously across all global markets. And indeed, if you look at what happened during the peak of the, of the pandemic crisis, there was huge stress around swap markets. So away from spot, but there was huge stress around spot markets and uh, swap markets. And once again, um, you know, FX forward markets started to jam up as a result of uh, concerns around bilateral credit within the market. OTC clearing would help to free that and it would help to create much better price formation, much better access to market liquidity and, and help to sort of reconsolidate, if you like, market liquidity. For Russia, the credit, credit switching, I think, it, it, so, it, so, is a perfect example of that. Yeah. So if I might say for Russia in general, I think this is even more important. Um, so I think in Russia, where we know, um, you know, that, that local players are often constrained in terms of their ability to access international liquidity, we have this kind of bifurcated marketplace, really, between international liquidity and domestic liquidity. And I think it's very important that that gets brought back together again. And that, of course, is why we support the exchange in, in, in everything they're doing around uh, expanding clearing for OTC um, to enable, you know, market participants to not suffer from from the, 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 the frictions that exist around bilateral credit. Yeah, we think it's important to allow local players to continue to trade under the limits. If, they, if their limits are full, they switch those to the clearinghouse, then they can carry on. So we like that. Um, moving on particularly to then to the exchange as, as a good segue in, just want to quickly bring in, you mentioned um, data and you, you talked about liquidity metrics. Um, you know, the exchange next year wants us to start doing early opening, clearly as it looks towards the east. You know, it's, it's new global, uh, uh, sort of largest global trading partner is China. Um, it's not the largest investment partner, but that's growing and we want it to grow. Um, but clearly, you know, as the investment starts to catch up with the goods and services, we need to open earlier. How challenging is that for, for yourselves uh, when you look at data particularly and trying to find a reference point at 7 a.m. Moscow time for the early opening in March? Um, is that a challenge? Can you be there day one or what can we do to help you? What sort of ideas should we be thinking about to get you there day one? Well, it's, going to be, it's certainly going to be a challenge. I, I totally understand the look east um, you know, that is, that, that's underway in Russia. It makes complete sense. Uh, India and China markets, by the way, are sort of also relatively uh, underdeveloped, in my opinion, within, within FX when compared to sort of global international markets in the West. But, um, you know, I think price formation when you change uh, hours is always a challenge, right? I think, you know, li liquidity um, begets liquidity. And ultimately, I think we, we find it much easier to make prices, obviously, where a price formation is already existing um, and where there is already price discovery on an effective club. That's why we support, obviously, effective central limit order book trading. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 there are obviously mechanisms around which would help create price formation, um, for example, opening auctions, things like that. Um, it will be interesting to see exactly what does happen. I don't have a completely clear view. My general view is that um, you still need international and domestic market liquidity to come together in order to create better liquidity conditions for clients to be able to trade. So my gut feel is it will still be most efficient to trade during the, uh, you know, during, during the standard exchange hours as exists today, rather than in those early hours. But obviously, for some market participants who are happy to pay the spread in order to reduce the risk, I suspect that uh, it will be a good and viable option for them. 
I think we've got one or two minutes before we finish. So just quickly moving on. Um, some of the initiatives that you've been supporting quite strongly, um, I think I know you supported both of these. Take them in turn. Take the, take the speed bump order book we introduced last year. I don't know if the audience is able to see some live prices from the speed bumps. Hope you can. From our side, we see in one million good prices, two, three ticks wide, uh, consistently across the board. Hopefully people can see that today. I know it's, it's a bit more difficult this in, in, in the current environment. And so to get a price in a million uh, in, um, in, in two, three ticks, I think is fantastic. Uh, and I think that's uh, something everybody wants. What is your views of A, the speed bump, and then if you can wrap up with the new introduction of FIFO as well, that would be also very helpful. Yeah, so the speed bump book is obviously something that we support. Um, we support the growth of the overall volume. Uh, you know, we support overall volumes growing on the exchange and that's what we'd like to see um, across actually both order books um, but obviously we particularly support the speed bump book it's something that we support uh, across all exchanges globally actually and we push for across all exchanges globally and the the, the idea is simply to give market makers a level of protection um, against people who simply utilize network advantages and network speed advantages in order to attempt to trade on old prices and stale prices within the market. Um, that simply makes it much more difficult for any market maker to provide consistent deep and cheap liquidity. Um, so having a speed bump simply allows uh, market makers an amount of protection against that sort of ultra network connectivity and gives them the opportunity to uh, you know, not face the cost of latency arbitrage. That helps us in turn to provide consistent and deep liquidity, which we are indeed doing across the speed bump book. And I believe if you look across that book, you will see cheaper, um, not only visible um, executable yeah. spreads, but cheaper actual effective spreads when you trade. And this is a very important point. Visible spreads are not necessarily the spreads that you actually get when you trade in a market. What is important is the effective spread that you actually pay. And that's a combination of the visible spread and your ability to actually hit the prices within the book. Right. Um, and have, and you seen, have you seen this across all the markets you say that you operate speed bumps? Have you seen these volumes continually to grow and, and, uh, and, and the liquidity to come into those because of these, this sort of effort that you're putting in, into indeed. speed bump order books? Indeed, that's exactly what we see. And importantly, we also grow. We also see the growth of the number of market participants involved in the price formation and price discovery process. So we see a much healthier market where not just two or three providers um, are responsible for all of the price formation and that's very important You're creating that protection for market makers makes for a much healthier market where the market share is is spread out more evenly um, and price formation is, is is therefore more effective giving that protection allows people to bring their capital to the market um, and absorb market risk and particularly if you bring that to bear on clients who perhaps don't have access to the market um, you know in the same way today with the clearing aspects that, that Moscow Exchange is offering, then it can become quite a compelling offering for people looking to get size done reliably against consistent and tight spreads. So why does consistency in FIFO also be something you support? You so say, FIFO is also- think you would, But I think you do. So we support FIFO. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the question is what you support it against. So um, what we support FIFO against is, 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 is a situation where um, you know, that the market participants have to effectively end up playing games by sending the same order multiple times across multiple gateways in order to try to secure queue priority, simply because there, are, there aren't the, the requisite uh, or, or correct technological architecture or rules around order queue priority. Um, so we support that as a, as, a, as a means of sort of creating some determinism within the order queue process. Um, importantly for us, it shouldn't just work in in and of itself, it should work in, in concert with other controls within the market. Um, and that's why we like FIFO together, particularly with speed bumps, because it creates, you know, a consistency of, of, of ability to know what your place in the order queue is going to be, but at the same time, providing you the, the price protection to allow you okay. to make uh, good, consistent liquidity. Okay. Jeremy, thank you very much. Very helpful. Uh, we compress a lot there into, uh, I think we slightly ran over. Hopefully Sorry. that's okay. No problem. I think we did very well. Um, thank you again once for, for, for joining this panel and uh, look forward to uh, speaking to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to uh, 
you know, joining you in Moscow again in a year's yes, time, hopefully, nice. when, when there'll be a vaccine <laughs> and whatever else. Thank Not you, on the Jeremy. beach, as you said. Mark. Thank you, Thanks. no problem. I'll hand you back, back to Moscow. You. Take care. Thank you. I'm waiting for you.